Okay, dann ähm, wechsle ich jetzt ins Englische, äh, weil der Vortrag wird auf Englisch sein. Hello everybody, welcome to the second presentation of the CoLab Erinnerungsarbeit oder Remembrance Work, which we have established this year at the University of Art and Design in Linz. My name is Angela Koch. I'm Professor of Media Studies and Chief of the Department of Aesthetics and Pragmatics um, of Audiovisual Media. Simon Strick's talk will be in English. The discussion afterwards will be in English and German. Please write your questions in the chat. I will read them out loud. Then maybe if we are not so many people, then uh, we unmute the mics. Um, so your mics are all muted and we will tape the talk and it will be streamed via YouTube. So I'm very, very happy to welcome Simon Strick for this online talk at the university or you are sitting in Potsdam, uh, but also here in, in Linz and I'm in Munich. Uh, Simon Strick is a scholar of cultural media and gender studies. In 2018, he started the research project Feeling Alt Right, Effective and Identity Politics of Online Extremism, which was funded by the Volkswagen Stiftung Foundation, Volkswagen Foundation. Transcript Verlag will publish his book based on this research this May. The German title is Rechte Gefühle, Affekte und Strategien des digitalen Faschismus. I'm already excited to read this book. Welcome, Simon, please. Go ahead. All right. Uh, thank you, Angela, for, for this kind introduction and thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure and a privilege to speak uh, somewhat out of the kind of stuffy American studies context that I'm used to, to speak at an art university. Um, this is always a privilege because the discussion is so much different, I think, than in a true, you know, hardcore academic kind of setting which I mostly am in. Um, and actually the, the project uh, that I'm going to talk about today was, was influenced very much by uh, people at the UDK, the Universität der Künste in Berlin, uh, where I gave a seminar on many of the things that I will be talking about today. Uh, and it was, that was the most uh, fantastic experience sharing this work with artists, because I think um, like this, this digital fascism that I wrote about is very much a thing that that demands a different sensibility than you find, for example, in extremism research or something like that. Uh, and so I'm very, very happy to be here. So my talk is called A Creature with Life of Its Own Fascism as Media Practice. And uh, I will not comment on this first picture, but rather show you this is the book that will be coming out in May, as you heard from Angela. Uh, hopefully in May, the, uh, I put some pressure on the publishers and hopefully we will make it um, uh, in six weeks to publish this thing. Um, I'm in a rather weird place now as a researcher because kind of like I finished a almost 500 page book uh, after three years of research and the book is not yet out. So I'm in this weird space of im Erscheinen, as we call it. Uh, where you're not really, you had your say, but it's not really there and nobody has yet reacted to it. And it's a really weird place to be in. Um, also because, um, and I will be talking about that maybe, um, writing on what I wrote about, that is the alternative right and fascism in the digital realm, neo-fascism, is writing on a moving target. So um, I handed in the manuscript in October um, and I made additions in each revision stage, you know, every uh, point of the correction of the manuscript where you kill typos and stuff, you have to insert new stuff happening, right? And, and that was kind of like a weird thing. It was working like for three years on a highly mobile, highly evolving target uh, or object, really. And so I'm in a weird place because I made some sort of closure because the book is finished, but at the same time, it's, you know, it's evolving all the time. And uh, we are part of this media scene in which this evolution takes place every day, I think. So the book kind of like deals with uh, phenomena in the digital realm that go from uh, the Gamergate event, which maybe some of you know, in 2014, uh, this first, uh, the first battle of the online culture war, they call it, 
and it tracks uh, various right-wing actors and discourses and, and aesthetics um, to the present day, that is to the end of 2020. Um, and um, I will be talking like half of the book I will be talking about today, half the talk will be on, on stuff that is in the book and the other half will be kind of like beyond that because I'm trying to move beyond the uh, the thing that I just did and, and trying to, you know, uh, tie up some loose ends or develop them further. So this is kind of like the movement of the of the talk in two parts. Like first is kind of like an introduction to the topic and to my work on on the topic, and the second one is more like speculation uh, kind of things. And I will hopefully you get the feeling like where the shift happens. So okay. Um, this is a thing I found this morning, and I wanted to preface the talk by, by this one. It's, uh, it's from a, a media scholar from the United States called Heather Burns, and she tweeted this uh, uh, sentence, this motto, um, from the uh, Open Rights Group. I don't know what the context is, uh, but, but I just loved the thing. If you add digital on top of a thing that is broken, you will have a broken digital thing. Um, and this is very much a, a good question or a good motto um, for uh, what, what if you add digital to fascism, what happens then? Well, you have digital fascism and, and you have a, a, or if you add digital on top of misogyny or things like that. And um, I want to preface the talk by this quote, maybe to come back to it in the discussion later, uh, because I think this sentence is very true and um, it is, it should or it should be informing a lot of work in digital media studies or, or media studies that work on the digital uh, because there is always like a broken thing beneath that digital that we are working on. But at the same time, I, I would argue and maybe we can discuss this later on that actually transforming neo fascism or what is called the alternative right into the digital produces a new sort, a new form of brokenness. So the broken thing is broken in the digital, but it's broken in a new and maybe interesting and maybe worrying way. And this is kind of like um, the preface to the talk. So my research started, um, the proper research for the book started uh, somewhat in 2017 uh, with an event that maybe some of you remember. Uh, it was the so-called Unite the Right demonstration in Charlottesville, Virginia in the US in August 2017. Um, and the book extends from that kind of moment uh, with going back and forth to, to other earlier phenomena, but kind of like the research started in this particular moment and it continued on to uh, the storming of the Capitol building in Washington DC on January 6th this year. Um, I bring these two events together because it's kind of like uh, uh, this is a thing that I want, I want to be talking about today. The Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville uh, was the first under Trumpian rule, uh, the first manifestation um, of a new coalition of what was then called the alternative right. And that was a coalition of real world militia, neo fascist organizations. Uh, revisionist, uh, neo-confederate organizations um, that came together with a group of actors that before wasn't on the street in the real world, but that were confined to the digital and that were like online hate cultures, toxic online cultures of uh, 4chan, uh, various uh, message boards, image boards, and something like that that the media described or like to describe as the trolls uh, of 4chan, you know, transgressive online people who would post swastikas for fun or for transgression or whatever. And the Unite the Right rally was interesting in that it brought a digital and an analog movement, both associated in various ways with fascism, with uh, white supremacy, with racism, with neo-confederate uh, neo kind of like ideas and ideologies, and brought them together into a real world manifestation. Um, I would argue that the same kind of mixture happened in uh, Washington on January 6, a confluence of very distinct movements that were both uh, rooted in the real world, coming from uh, various organizations or parties or, or uh, whatever, and a digital or digitally raised movement. 
um, that brought their own digital uh, behaviors with them uh, to the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. And in a way, for me, January 6th was uh, a very interesting moment because I thought while I was finishing typos in my manuscript, um, I thought to myself, now everybody sees what I have seen in my research. And um, on the lower left-hand side, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Can you? Can you see my mouse moving? Yeah. Um, these images here are like uh, from the research that, that I did. This one is from Reddit, from a, a gun-centered, kind of like uh, hardcore patriot uh, right-wing uh, forum, Weekend Gunnit. Um, and kind of like these were things that I collected. These were people that I tracked or followed or I was part of these forums. And people would post like fantasy costumes, how they prepare for an imaginary civil war uh, and things like that. People would make memes like this one over here. These are, uh, this is from a channel associated with the Boogaloo Boys or the Boogaloo Movement, which also was part of January 6. Um, disregard females acquire automatic weapons. So this whole kind of uh, posturing, getting ready for a civil war were things that I have seen online as online behaviors. And on January 6, kind of like this materialized uh, and, and took kind of like the world stage um, as these same people came with their same fantasy costumes, with their memes now as flags, with their, uh, uh, with their employ uh, employee badges. So the people were there as themselves with their employee badges uh, so they could be very easily identified afterwards, right? Um, and they would be, uh, but well, they killed uh, four people. I think were dead uh, from from um, you know security uh, people working at Washington D.C. Uh, one demonstrator was shot, but most of the people were there uh, as regular people, as kind of like ordinary people going on to that very kind of like weird civil war uh, weekend. Uh, um, activity in a certain sense, like storming the Capitol without really uh, knowing what they were doing. They brought their Southern pride flags, which they had displayed earlier, which they display online every day. Uh, and they brought their media behaviors, taking selfies in the Senate chamber and things like that. So in a way, it was for me uh, very interesting because every I, I was familiar with uh, like these people and these gestures and these uh, symbols that they used. Um, and at the same time, it was uh, the media talked about it like a coup or an insurrection or something like that. And, and I thought uh, these are the people, you know, I follow them every day. This insurrection was going on since 2017 every day online in a way. And now it has materialized in a certain sense. Uh, what I found interesting about January 6th was uh, a certain type, and I will explain it, a certain type of ordinariness of these people that were storming the Capitol. Um, they brought, as I just explained, they brought their online live worlds, their very ordinary live worlds, which are filled with uh, Southern pride flags, with tactical gear, with uh, kind of like a weird uh, uh, weapon fetishism, a weird sort of uh, nationalism. They brought all of that to the world stage and presented that and did very silly things. They stole stuff from the Capitol, you know, decorations and st stuff like that. They raided uh, politicians' uh, offices and things like that. They, they threatened people. But at the same time, they were really also there to take a selfie like this, you know, to, to photograph yourself in the Senate chamber, in the speaker's chamber, uh, in the speaker's chair. So what I think is what happened is that um, these people came from a different time and more specifically from a different timeline. And uh, I think in my work, I try, to, uh, I try to argue that the people who did this insurrection or coup or Trump rally in the wrong place or whatever, um, they have timelines just like every social media user has, like you have. I have a Twitter timeline that told me on January 6th that an insurrection is happening at the White House, uh, um, at the Capitol building, um, and that far right actors are now overthrowing, trying to overthrow the election. That was my Twitter timeline, what, what it told me. Their timeline told them uh, what is happening in DC is an election being stolen and the country being liberated by uh, patriotic crowds. You know, and so these people come from 
a different timeline and the Capitol building storm on January 6th was kind of like a clash of two timelines, two social media timelines that meet in the real world and have a problem because they have a really not opposing but inverted worldviews. Where we saw a, uh, an insurrection or a coup um, by some radicalized masses or whatever um, against the ratification of an election, they saw quite the opposite. They saw a coup by the state that was, uh, you know, uh, being fought by true patriots uh, in a certain sense. And, and this is kind of like one of the motives that I try to track in the book and also today is that there are alternate realities clashing in these events. And this was already the case in the Unite the Right rally, um, but less um, obviously so. Uh, January 6th uh, in Washington, D.C. was kind of like it was what I call a, a swarm movement or a social media driven movement of people who inhabit a different reality from most other people. Um, and they bring their ordinary worlds with them. They bring their, uh, their, their signage, their symbols and their sensibilities with them to these events. Um, what is happening is actually also something that they think about. So, so these processes of, you know, timelines, digital timelines, digital behaviors, digital habits becoming real is something that they think about. And this is a quote I found uh, in 2019 on a crypto fascist um, uh, forum on Reddit called Friend World. Uh, and I think it is a brilliant uh, description of, of what I want to talk about or what I see, what I see is happening. Here's a user called OpenS Video Editor, and he uh, wrote the following in 2019. This world will only go more and more insane, which is kind of like also a feeling that, that I had when I saw January 6th on, on TV or that I saw when I, uh, you know, when I did research. Uh, more and more insane as the Internet starts slowly sipping into reality and fusing with it. Each day I start seeing normies. Normies are normal people. Uh, like people who are not part of 4chan or other illicit message boards. Um, normies talking about things that were only discussed on 4chan. And at this point, we created a creature with life of its own. And this creature is restricted to colors of light uh, emit, uh, on, on a light emitting screen, but its effects on reality seem to be very real. Um, this is a very apt description of what I think is happening with uh, you know, the uh, digital discourses and digital infrastructures in which this fascism uh, works and grows and thrives um, when they spill out onto the street or into the real world, as it were. Um, and there's a kind of fusion happening between uh, digital forms of behavior or digital habits or digital discourse and real world discourse, which we see unfolding every day, I think. So I think... Uh, the most concise uh, descriptions of what the alt-right or the alternative right or neo-fascism does uh, comes actually from neo-fascists themselves. They, they are, and this was one thing that uh, is very strong in the book and that was uh, new to me. These uh, right-wing actors explain very clearly and theorize about what is happening and what they are doing, uh, which is a new thing because, uh, you know, extremism research, for example, always talks of shady uh, organizations operating in the shadows and secret networks and stuff like that. These uh, people that are researched are super in the open. They are super <laughs> clear about what they do and they argue about what they are going to do. And this is uh, one of the things that I've found is super, uh, like this is a thing that I'm interested in and it's very well discussed on 4chan. So what are people talking about on 4chan actually? And this is kind of like uh, the meat of, of the ideology side of the alternative right that I'm writing about. Um, 4chan um, is an image board, as most of you know, it's an anonymous image board, which has kind of like a rep uh, reputation for being um, the, the cesspool of the internet, is where all the hate comes from, is where all the bad memes come from. Um, and it's kind of like a very safe haven for uh, nationalists, uh, neo-fascists, and, and various other forms of online hate. Uh, 4chan, I use it uh, as a kind of like term for a lot of different image boards, like Reddit used to be a place like 4chan and, you know, uh, 4chan is an umbrella term for many things. So, so what are people doing actually on 
4chan. I think uh, they are doing something that the right wing calls um, using leftist theory metapolitics. Metapolitics is a key term to understanding uh, what the current right does. Um, and metapolitics is defined by uh, kind of like a cultural battle for shaping attitudes of people and the shaping of feelings or sensibilities. That is, um, metapolitics means a battle for dominance in the cultural realm and precisely in the pre-political realm. So uh, these actors that uh, did research on and many, many more um, are trying not to win the political war by going for majorities or uh, party membership or votes or something like that, but going for attitudes in the everyday, going for cultural sensibilities uh, and trying to reshape them. And one of the biggest terms that probably all of you have heard is the great replacement uh, that kind of like sometimes it's described as a, as a um, conspiracy theory. I would describe it as a, as a complete worldview. Um, the great replacement is the idea that uh, in majority white societies such as Germany or Austria or uh, North America, um, there is a process going on to replace the white population with non-white populations. Um, the great replacement is uh, kind of like circulates in various uh, fashions uh, uh, and versions. Um, sometimes it's associated with a kind of like a Jewish conspiracy that uh, kind of like uh, controls governments um, uh, and forces them or, or um, kind of like tricks them into increasing migration and suppressing uh, white reproduction rates, for example. Sometimes it's just this is a process that is happening and we need to stop it. But the Great Replacement, no matter if it's a full-blown conspiracy uh, or if it's just a worldview, is kind of like the cornerstone of what the alternative right, as I call it, is doing at the moment. So the idea that white people are being replaced in their white countries. Uh, this is wrong in various ways, some of which are interesting, some of which are blatantly uninteresting. Um, and I will not talk about kind of like, I, I, I don't falsify, I don't tend to falsify these theories. I tend to talk about them as discourses that work in a certain way. Um, one of the ways in, in which the great replacement works is that it works metapolitically. It works as a part of metapolitics of making uh, uh, or of introducing different sensibilities and different feelings and attaching them to uh, to various discourses. Um, one of the most prominent is um, that the grid replacement is kind of like short short circuited uh, with the idea of diversity or multiculturalism. So, um, like Germany or Austria, for example, perceive themselves in some way, shape, or form as uh, multicultural societies. Um, voluntarily or not is, is something beside the point. And one of the terms that the mainstream has adopted is diversity. Um, you know, it's a diverse society. And, and then we have diversity programs and the alt-right tries to sh reshape like diversity as a good term, Vielfalt, as we say in German, and tries to reshape it into a bad term. And they do it by uh, memes like this one up here, which talks about Sweden. Diversity is code for white genocide. So uh, behind that is the theory that diversity is a, a kind of like hegemonic discourse that uh, that wants to cloak um, that actually um, a great replacement is happening of white people. So diversity is held out by cultural uh, uh, hegemonic forces as a good term because it masks the replacement going on. Um, the it has become a veritable slogan and you can find it in various manifestations. Diversity is code for white genocide. It was coined in uh, 1990 by a uh, American neo-fascist called Bob Whitaker. And it has since become kind of like one of the slogans of, of the hardcore old, right? Um, and what it does is like it introduces metapolitical, uh, it works metapolitically. It makes diversity into a suspicious term that people should be worried about because Diversity is not really about diversity. It's about um, you know a cloaking device. It's a cloaking device to um, make uh, um, to draw attention away from the replacement that is happening. The same on the right hand side, 
um, where we would talk about, for example, multiculturalism, or we would talk about the humanities, or we would talk about uh, inclusivity or something like that, integration, they talk about something they call cultural Marxism. Um, I will not explain that today. It's a very large kind of like conspiracy theory. Um, and they um, then contrast that with race consciousness, that is consciousness of being a white person and inhabiting a so-called white culture, which are phantasmatic constructions in a certain sense. But, but then they will kind of like um, these images that we, that we learn uh, in their opinion to, to perceive as normal, um, they want to re-normalize these things, and one should recognize that one has, you know, something in common with Gary Cooper, for example. If you are a white person, then you should identify with Gary Cooper. This is metapolitical work that tries to re, uh, refashion the sensibilities towards discourse in, in very many people or in the audience of these memes, for example. Um, one should not so much think about how to counter racism, but rather think about something that they call, uh, and this is this meme down here, uh, ethno-pluralism, that is the uh, separate uh, maintenance of, of different ethnicities. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it used to be called segregation and the alternative right remade it into a slogan called ethno-pluralism, which is basically the same thing, but, but it sounds more positive. And these are kind of like the metapolitical maneuvers that they do. Um, uh, to make terms feel a different way. And uh, one of the major um, developments that are traced in the book is how the alternative right focuses less on things that we usually associate it uh, with fascism or right-wing extremism, that is xenophobia, fremdenfeindlichkeit, and things like that, but focuses more on a language of ethno-pluralism all of a sudden, or of uh, white endangerment or white genocide or things like that. Uh, this are, these are metapolitical operations, as I call them in the book. Um, it's a repackaging, basically, of uh, having an racist uh, uh, um, attitude towards non-white people, and it's repackaged as being in a position of danger of oneself as a white person. White supremacy is uh, not... Like the point of propaganda is not white people are superior, but white people are in danger. And this is a very, very uh, important kind of like switch uh, that the alternative right has uh, um, has made with regards or in contradistinction to the old right or old neo-fascism. Um, this I want to talk longer about. Um, these are memes that I found in 2018, I think. Uh, the one on the left-hand side. Um, I always show this. Um, it's a kind of like weird uh, mimetic language that they use. So, so this is from 4chan. Uh, the other one is from a Reddit forum called the Donald, which was all about Don Donald Trump in the beginning and then became a neo-fascist extreme right-wing um, kind of forum. And uh, this is basically, I think, the what, what I call the affective stance, the affective stance of, of the alternative right. Um, it's an identification with an indigenous endangered group. So um, this meme on the left-hand side imagines that uh, Native Americans in the U.S. Uh, are were in the same position as white people are in Germany, for example, at the moment. So an, assa an assailed uh, indigenous minority that is being threatened by foreign colonizers. Immigrants threatening your way of life, like, um, you know, um, the colonial forces did in, in North America. Um, I know that fear bros. So there's something like an affective, um, an imaginary, phantasmatic affective reciprocation be between Native Americans and, uh, and well, the identitarians, the white identitarians. Um, the Identitaire Bewegung and your dear countrymen uh, Martin Zellner actually put this on their on their homepage for the for the Identitaire Bewegung that um, you cannot uh, that they, they argued that you cannot attack white people for defending themselves against non-white people in Europe at the moment because you wouldn't uh, attack Native Americans for defending themselves against colonizers in the 18th century in America. Um, so, so this kind of like weird phantasmatic effective connection to 
indigenous populations elsewhere is kind of like what I call the affective stance of the alternative right, which is an anti-colonial stance. The feeling uh, that these online communities and these actors share or want to instigate is a feeling of being colonized and rebelling against it. So it's, it's an anti-colonial discourse. It's uh, the discourse of white indigenous people in Britain, as you see on the right-hand side here, um, defending themselves against their erasure by foreign um, or sometimes even domestic uh, enemies and colonizing forces. Um, so, so in a certain way, what, what we used to associate with uh, right-wing extremism, uh, a slogan like Ausländer raus, um, is now replaced in the language, in the metapolitical language, um, by slogans like White Lives Matter, uh, which they put on, uh, I don't know where that is actually, it's, I think it's in London, um, which they put up on uh, Indigenous People's Day uh, in in London. Uh, I think this is Patriot Front or, or something like that. So, so a, a white English nationalist uh, and neo-fascist organization. And so uh, kind of like the, the old slogans that, that still most people associate with the extreme right get replaced by new ones which are harder to, to debate or harder to refute actually, like white lives matter, um, which seems to be like, uh, you know, for most people who are not touched by these discourses would say like, well, uh, black lives matter, of course, white lives matter too. But it's, this is kind of like an expression of this anti-colonial stance that they have. So uh, these white people feel like uh, uh, black people imagine imaginarily <laughs> feel uh, for them. So, so it's a kind of like reversal of discourses that is going on, um, which is very interesting because it uses minority discourses like identity politics for to, to thematize the feelings of majorities or the imagined feelings of majorities and the imagined situations of majorities in majority uh, white uh, white countries. The point of this is, and, and this is always so, so difficult uh, with these actors, is that, of course, one could take the, uh, 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 the task uh, to explain to them or to refute or to counter uh, these charges. Like, uh, one would have to go on a very long explanation spree to, to say, like, uh, why is Black Lives Matter a good slogan? Why is White Lives Matter not a good slogan? But these slogans, um, why is white lives matter racist slogan? But these slogans work affectively. They work quicker than the explanations that uh, uh, an informed, like mainstream, could offer to them. Um, and and so they they work more uh, to to produce feelings of being at risk. So so uh, um, uh, produce feelings of being endangered in some way, shape, or form, even though one is not. Um, so, so remember from this kind of like the anti-colonial or, or the feeling of being colonized and having to rebel against it. Um, from these uh, kind of like mimetic um, or, or meme-oriented uh, versions comes what I call uh, in the book an atomization of risk positions. So um, as kind of like emancipatory politics or something like multiculturalism is refashioned uh, as a way for white people to feel endangered, um, th this kind of fascism or neo-fascism enters into something uh, that, that I took from Ulrich Beck, and that is a sort of reflexivity. Um, Ulrich Beck talks in Risikogesellschaft, his famous book from 1986, about the reflexive society, which turns um, all the innovations from the first modernity, from industrialization, into risk positions. And, and we know this uh, into production of risk. And we know this, for example, from, from, uh, uh, from the discourse on Umweltverschmutzung, like, like everything that the first modernity did, that industrialization did, uh, like, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, rationalization of production, mass production, and things like that, are remade in second modernity or in reflexive modernity, as he calls it, into the production of risks, for example, for the environment or for people, uh, pollution and things like that. And things that were um, kind of like standardization before come back as uh, uh, a risk uh, for populations. And therefore, discourse 
or modernity itself becomes reflexive. I think this fascism in a certain way also becomes reflexive in that it thinks about emancipatory politics like Black Lives Matter, for example, uh, and all the things that were produced in answer to fascism and to totalitarianism, like uh, democracy, emancipatory politics, um, uh, uh, Gleichstellung, multiculturalism, all of these positions are remade into risk positions for white majorities or for majority populations. And this is the fundamental operation that I call uh, fascism becoming reflexive. Uh, it is less about articulating supremacy, but articulating positions of risk by, for example, emancipation or Gleichstellung or uh, things like that. Um, in social media, these risk positions um, are atomized. They are distributed over a, a myriad, uh, a multitude of pressure points so that everybody consuming these media and being part of this discourse or just being exposed to it can find some way, shape or form to be addressed, to be affected by these risks by these uh, positions of endangerment or of precarity. And I have just a, a couple of things that you might remember from recent times or not. Uh, Wikipedia, for example, is here pointed out that only white pride is associated with uh, white supremacy and fascism is something bad, whereas Asian pride, gay pride and black pride are not. These are positive things, says Wikipedia. So one should feel as a white person that Wikipedia in some way, shape or form is anti-white and puts you in a marginalized position. Um, other people like, you know, Lisa Eckhart uh, can feel, according to the IFD, as uh, minorities being at risk for certain things, for example, for her jokes or whatever. It is always a white person at risk uh, in these discourses, right? But cancel culture is kind of like a super shady, uh, super fuzzy concept for most of the people feeling at risk. Uh, uh, or being able to feel at risk. For example, somebody blocks you on Twitter, must be cancel culture, you are at risk of being silenced, for example. They, these are things that you can feel. Um, they even adopt uh, old feminist slogans like the guy on the right here at a Corona demonstration in Berlin, uh, where he says he, he doesn't want to be vaccinated because mein Körper gehört mir, my body belongs to me, which is the old uh, feminist slogan uh, for abortion. And there are whole, like hosts and myriads of other pressure points and other reversals of uh, uh, that, that make majorities into minorities, into like felt minorities. Um, like for example, uh, being conservative now is the same as being gay in the 1950s is a, is a popular uh, thing that has been used a lot of times um, the IFD talks about uh, there's a racism against Germans and nobody's talking about it, which is both silencing by the majority discourse and also discrimination against Germans. And here we have Martin Zerner with his now wife, uh, Brittany Pettibone, talking about heterosexual relationships being marginalized uh, on Tinder of all places. So uh, this is really to show that um, what I've talked about in terms of meta politics is distributed in the online realm on social media into a million different pressure points in which people can feel or sense or um, or attune themselves to their own oppression, to their own risk. Um, the alternative right and the people are followed um, do a lot of cultural work or metapolitical work um, in that way, and mostly it uh, mostly but not exclusively it of course, jails around the position of white masculinity or the white man in the majority white society. Um, I show here two examples. One is a YouTuber called Blackpilled, uh, who is a perfect propagandist. Uh, if you, if you want to see uh, like top-notch right-wing propaganda, this is really a guy to see. Um, and what, what he does, he has actually a very good series, very good. <laughs> Uh, a series where he reads classic Hollywood movies, how they devalue white men um, and how they marginalize white men. So, so how every white uh, masculinity in, in modern cinema is kind of like a broken or an impotent or a conflicted thing. And he reads that as a, uh, you know, Hollywood brainwashing of the population into devaluing white men. 
Um, and this is really a top-notch archival work that he does. It's cultural studies work. He reads movies in a very uh, interesting way. With uh, the ideology behind it, there is a marginalization of white men going on. And he has a vast archive of that. Um, this is kind of like stuff that people do, right-wingers do on social media. They built these counter archives, which are not about um, you know, what, what I would be interested in in cultural studies, but rather uh, follow a thesis that there has been happening a marginalization of white people and especially white men um, in the West. Uh, this other one is really interesting. It's a, uh, it's a channel on Telegram, the messenger, uh, which collects advertising which feature uh, pieces of advertising with, which feature uh, a non-white male and a white woman. Um, and the point of this is, and he has like, uh, or he, she, they, um, they have like 15 examples per day. So they have 15, uh, 15 pieces of visual evidence that white men are being erased in advertising and um, are erased and replaced by interracial relationships, which is always a, a, a non-white man and a white woman. So this is kind of like the replacement that they see is happening on the cultural level, uh, the visual erasure of white men as a positive role model. Um, this is archival work. So they're building counter archives to, to uh, you know, counter mainstream archives very diligently. And then we have uh, people like this guy here called Red Pill 101 is also a YouTube channel who then kind of like distills all of these archives and all of this data and all of these risk points into very personal uh, videos. Uh, for example, why are American men not getting laid? So he translate the devaluation of white masculinity. Uh, he connects that to the great replacement, which wants to marginalize white people and then channels that back into kind of like a self-help discourse um, that explains to YouTube viewers who are mostly young, who are mostly white and mostly men, or have been for a long time, why they are not getting girlfriends, having sex, or whatever they want uh, in their lives. So, so this is kind of like not only an atomization of risk positions, but also uh, making them intimate and uh, projecting them into uh, the media users uh, reality and, and intimate, like everyday ordinary reality. Why do I not have a girlfriend? It must be the great replacement. And this is kind of like uh, the, um, the thing that they want to achieve that uh, the great replacement or the marginalization of white people, which is phantasmatic, becomes a reflexive, uh, it becomes a reflex basically uh, that explains your problems if you are a white man in a Western country. Um, there's a book that helped me a ton and that I can only recommend uh, for everyone to read. It's called uh, Ordinary Affects by Kathleen Stewart. Um, it's really autoethnography of sorts, uh, and she talks about affect a lot. Uh, and she explains in that book uh, how the ordinary happens as an affective uh, kind of process, how people orient themselves in situations. And she explains affect in a very, very good way that I've used throughout the book. Um, she has interestingly um, a short piece in the book on a book called The Turner Diaries, which is something like the neo-fascist Bible uh, in North America. The Turner Diaries is a fictitious novel about a race war happening in which white people, um, you know, get their guns and um, uh, go to Washington, D.C. and uh, storm the Capitol and shoot all the traitors of the white race and whatnot. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a novel about a race war. Um, and it's been, uh, you know, circulating online ever since. It was written in uh, late 80s um, by a prominent neo-fascist as a sort of novel. Uh, she writes a very th interesting thing about this book, uh, which I will quote now. Uh, the Turner, uh, Turner Diaries is a recipe book for domestic competence. A little world comes into view. It is a world based on a military model of community and skill, but it is one that is filled too with the textures and sensory details needed to imagine a dream world, an alternative timeline, as it were. 
This lived affective constellation of practices and sensibilities make the book not just an ideological diatribe, which it is, um, but also a scene of life filled with worries, fetishes, compulsions, and hoped for satisfactions. It is possible to imagine how for those readers who find it compelling, but are not about to build bombs or stolen the Capitol building, it's a kind of self-help book. It's self-help racism. And this is a very interesting observation that I've made time and time again in, um, in, in these online forums and this material that I looked. This guy, of course, is talking about misogyny. He's talking about, uh, uh, he, he has an uh, you know, objectified image of women. Um, he's talking about um, you know, all sorts of ideological things in a certain sense that we associate with the alternative right. He also talks about a way for white men to help themselves against their own uh, uh, oppression in a certain sense, which is you know, explicit in, I'm not getting laid tonight. This is your oppression. Then he provides them with a, you know, uh, uh, with a model of living against that in a certain sense, self-help racism. And this is a very strong current in all the alternative right that they connect to intimate kind of like scenarios of powerlessness and then help you beyond that, help their audiences beyond that. So, so kind of like uh, I describe that in a book, it's kind of like white power discourses becoming white empowerment discourses, empowerment. Um, I have two examples for that, and I'll oh, wait for time. Okay, well, I should come to a conclusion now. Uh, maybe I'll just give you the first one because I like it so much. Uh, this is from a men's rights forum. So uh, one of the forums called, called MGTOW, Men Going Their Own Way on Reddit, uh, which is about uh, uh, masculine empowerment because uh, their thesis goes, we live in a female-dominated society, we live in a feminist-dominated society, and men are being marginalized. And there's this user called Mr. Krabs uh, who posted this image with, uh, with a short narration of what happened to him. Uh, and he writes, he's moving into a new apartment after getting out of a toxic relationship. And I'm finally decorating the place how I want to. So this is kind of like one of these little scenes of life that Kathleen Stewart describes. There's a little scene of, I was oppressed in a toxic relationship with a woman who was most likely a feminist, and I escaped from this regime of oppression into my new apartment, and now I can, without being debated and without being criticized, put, can put my Trump pillow on my, uh, on my couch. And this is kind of like one of the scenes that I'm, or, or scenes that I'm interested in, in uh, describing something like an ordinary fascism or an ordinary misogyny where people construct little, uh, little worlds of oppressedness uh, and then little scenarios of freeing themselves from this oppressedness. Uh, and, and how these scenarios uh, turn out is really different and is really uh, depending on a lot of different factors. So, so he has bought a Trump pillow and he's you know, lot, exited the relationship which was toxic to him and oppressing him as a man. Um, the other guy talks about barricades in Washington, D.C., so I will skip him. Uh, and I would rather talk about how people organize their live worlds according to these little scenarios of being oppressed and liberating themselves from it. Imaginary oppression. You know, if you are in a bad relationship, you just get out of it. You're not oppressed. You're just, you know, but that's beside the point. Um, and now we'll talk a bit about how, how this resembles for me something I call mimetic agitation, which comes, of course, from memes. And in case you don't know, I think everybody knows, but I will just explain what a meme does in my, in my reading. Because these things here, this is good social media practice. You turn your life into a social media form of narration, into a social media genre, and you put your life into a scenario that is good on social media. Here's the image how I improve myself. This is good social media practice. Um, memes do something very specific, I think, uh, in that they help to produce such little scenes that the alt-right loves to do. Um, and memes, in my reading, do something very interesting. You have a template for a meme, and this is the distracted boyfriend meme that you probably all know. And within that frame of reference, you insert 
the person making the meme insert another frame of reference which corresponds to the syntax or to the template or whatever you have. So Phil Collins now doing pop music and Proc Rock is the, uh, you know, Jello's girlfriend. Uh, and this is kind of like this constellation is put into Phil Collins between two musical genres, shifting his attention from one to the other. The same with uh, Reddit, uh, not caring about daily Islamic terrorist killings, but now talking about the Christchurch uh, murderer uh, in 2019, this is where this meme came out, is the same syntax as Phil Collins and as the original one. So. Um, what memes actually do, I think, is they take disparate knowledges or disparate items from different frames of knowledge and clash them together in a way that somewhat makes sense, but at the same time dissolves both frames of reference. We don't know if now uh, this is, uh, you know, Reddit behaves like a boyfriend, like a distracted boyfriend, or uh, what kind of thing is critiqued here. The thing is, uh, memes are not informative, but they are sticky because they clash disparate frame of references and uh, make them into irritating short circuits of disparate information in a certain sense. This is um, why memes do so well in what we now have online, the attention economy. It is an economy in which information is not so much circulated um, or, or doesn't circulate well because it's true or accurate or well researched, but because it grabs attention, because the scarce commodity on the internet is attention and not information. And kind of like memes are interesting because they take disparate forms of knowledge or disparate uh, items from the online archives and mash them together in an irritating way, in a uh, not constructive way in a certain sense. So, so we don't know if this is an apt description uh, of what the youth seems to do at the moment. Memes are not true, memes are sticky is kind of like how I would describe it. The alternative right uses this all the time, um, the, this technology, the meme technology in a certain sense in, in, a chart, in, in uh, memes like this, for example. This is from 2016, I guess. It's not a Holocaust denial, but it's a relativization of the Holocaust in that uh, the death of six million Jews in World War II um, is larger than, uh, you know, the other casualties, which are, of course, wrong numbers. But kind of like what this, what this thing does, it, the frame of reference is on the one hand statistics and the cake diagram, and on the other hand, memorial culture. That, of course, uh, uh, World War II was very much about the Holocaust, and the Holocaust is very much, and national uh, socialism was very much about the extermination of the Jewish population in Germany. Um, not only, but, but you know what I mean. Um, and kind of like this meme tries to implode that frame of reference. It tries to implode uh, the idea of counting casualties or deaths um, and memorial culture. This leads to kind of like it amounts to not denial of the Holocaust, but a radical radicalization of Holocaust and memorial culture of the Holocaust, the remembrance of the Holocaust. And this is the thing that memes do, they implode the frame of reference that they are using uh, to make a point at the same time. Uh, I will not explain this, maybe it's self-explanatory, I don't know. Um, this turns into this implosion of frames of reference and the uh, taking over certain uh, cultural symbols or facts or relations or whatever, and clashing them together with something else um, has, in my opinion, translated from the digital, from digital memes into real world agitations. And these are uh, photographs from a Corona demonstration in Berlin uh, in August last year, where uh, this fella here um, kind of like paraded around with an image of a so-called iron muzzle, uh, a slave torture device uh, in North America in South America in the 19th century. And of course, the whole point, which Attila Hildmann over here makes clear, is that, uh, you know, mouth, uh, mouth and nose protection uh, during Corona times is the same as a slave mask. So uh, who, whoever wears a mask is a slave. Um, this is, in my opinion, a meme agitation because it takes a frame of reference, slavery, um, to express a certain feeling 
that a person has a certain uh, it works by analogy, like here's a mask and there's another mask. And so these masks feel the same. They must be the same. But at the same time, as it kind of like makes this, produces this sticky moment of that you can attach your feeling to of being, you know, muzzled uh, in Corona times. Um, at the same time, it undermines the frame of reference that slavery is. So it takes the force of slavery to uh, produce an moment that you can identify with, that you can stick to as a person feeling oppressed by Corona. And at the same time, it makes relative slavery in itself as a symbol. So you claim the symbol as an affective structure, as a structure of feeling. And at the same time, you undermine it um, uh, by relativizing it. And this is kind of like this weird way that the alternative right, that I call alternative right, always claims the discourses it critiques at the same time. So they talk about, uh, you know, all, all the mainstream talks about is uh, racism against black people. I feel like black people and at the same time, black people are not oppressed. So, so it's kind of like a weird uh, back and forth that they do uh, a performative contradiction, which they love because this is what sticks in the attention economy. And I've followed Attila Hildmann for a year now. Uh, it's, you know, if you are an art student or a person interested in art, I think uh, Attila Hildmann, what he does online is is a piece of performance art that is really worrying, <laughs> that is really horrible, but, but it's kind of like, it's just performative contradictions. It's something like Christoph Schlingensief uh, updated into a neo-fascist and at the same time, uh, weirdly post-migrant uh, form of fascist performance art. Okay, so we're almost done. Um, timelines, uh, for, from these kind of like mimetic logistics, these meme logistics, how people then organize their feelings into these performative contradictions with symbols that the mainstream gives them, um, come then, uh, like a sensibility that allows them to decode all the things that are going on in their alternative, uh, alternate worldview. Um, so they inhabit something, what I would call alternative timelines or alternate timelines. So you can, like Attila Hildmann, uh, read the Bildschlagzeile, is it Corona or is it just the flu? Weder noch, neither nor, it's an insurrection. You know, is it ein Staatsstreich? And you, they are honing and they are developing and um, producing distributing the sensibility that you have to counter read everything that you see in mainstream discourse. And this is really, that, that's what they call themselves ideology, uh, ideology uh, critics. And they are, you know, it's ideology critique what they do. It's uh, kind of like counter reading what we used to learn in cultural studies too. Um, some people even express like they are actually now inhabiting a different timeline uh, this person has uh, has set his clock to 1938, and the Gestapo uh, roams through through the apartments and things like that. And um, he's ready as an oppressed minority to be taken or to go to war to join the resistance or whatever. Uh, Attila Hildmann has has really um, he just posts like uh, watch all these movies about conspiracies and uh, totalitarian states, this is precisely what is happening right now. So you are inhabiting a timeline that comes from V4 Vendetta, or you are inhabiting a situation in your everyday that comes from 12 Monkeys, or something like that. Um, maybe I will skip this guy so we have more time to debate. This is actually, maybe I'll show it just okay, briefly. You know, that sounds um, this is a guy at the AfD demonstration in 2017, uh, and he inhabits one of these timelines where he has to critically read everything. And I find this so interesting because the, uh, he turns into an automated uh, ideology critique function. He's a, he's a walking meme, as it were. So he's being interviewed by, uh, by you know, mainstream media. Uh -huh. Schön, dass Sie auch hier sind. Genau. Was haben Sie denn Schönes? Warum sagen Sie Lügen und Funk? Weil die Berichterstattung, die Sie über die AfD abhalten und über die, die gesamte Thematik äußerst tendenziös ist und mit äh, dem öffentlich-rechtlichen Informationsauftrag absolut nichts zu tun hat. Sie sind ein politisch gleichgeschaltetes Globalisierungsmedium 
und nichts anderes. Und ich sehe überhaupt nicht ein, warum ich noch länger. This is so interesting, uh, because I think what, what you see here, the, these mimetic implosions of the frame of reference um, that are supposed to express uh, kind of like a, uh, an adversarial position to the mainstream. The mainstream oppresses you and you have uh, a, a program of yourself that you can work against that. Um, and this is kind of like an expression of that. Um, all, all these people do in these posts and things like that is prepare for a situation like this. In this situation, they anticipate these situations all the time online when they argue, uh, when they go on the street, when they're being interviewed. It's like, I'm a medium myself. I'm a critical counter medium. And I'm now being interviewed by the other medium, by the dominant hegemonic medium. And they have these little automated replies and automated things to sort what is happening into a different worldview, and then they can just deliver automatically like a machine or like a medium, like these uh, preformed uh, kind of things to change the frame of reference. Well, the media interviews me. No, I tell you what the media are. Um, this is kind of like the last example I want to show. Uh, this was posted yesterday. Um, on the left hand side, you see a post by Martin Zerner where, where he tries to correlate uh, corona restrictions uh, of movement in Vienna with uh, what he seems to think is kind of like a, a totally unrestricted immigration to Austria, uh, which is, of course, both things are not the case. I think I don't know what the situation in Vienna is. Can you exit the Wiener Neustadt at the moment? I don't really know, um, but kind of like this is. Um, this is two frames of reference clash together to produce a sticky moment. Like there are restrictions in Vienna, which of course affect all sorts of people and not only white people like uh, Martin Zerner. Um, and at the same time, there is a freedom of movement for all non-white people coming to Austria. Uh, and this is kind of like the, uh, the sticky situation that he wants to produce, which is a, a form of media operation that he does here. Um, to produce a meme, like the one, uh, uh, one thing is prohibited, one movement is prohibited, that of white people in Vienna and Neustadt, uh, and the other movement is allowed. This is the replacement and the disenfranchisement and everything I've been talking about. Um, this is a meme, and, and you always think, is this, uh, you know, what, what is the effect of that? Um, this is a guy on the right hand side here called Dave McIntosh, um, I think, and he posted this. Um, like a month ago, but reposted it now uh, because he has the same feeling that Martin Zerner has and he puts it into a social media performance that I find interesting. Um, he he puts this situation, which is kind of like a, you know, a right wing critique of their oppression of the oppressive regime of Corona, of multiculturalism and everything I've been talking about. Um, and he puts it, he remodels that into a social media challenge for himself. He wants to challenge himself. And it's a three minute clip. Please listen to him. I, I found this fascinating. So on Friday, I went to train with some friends and uh, we were apprehended by the police. Uh, they pulled us over and um, they threatened us with a 800 pound fine, showered at us for a bit. He said, uh, he looked at me and he said, that's your fault. It's people like you. This lockdown's lasting as long as it is. And it's so restrictive because people like you all the while our government's got open borders people are crammed in on construction sites foreigners all crammed together can't even read the covid restriction sites i've got a baby on the way and a one-year-old at home and i've got no work i'm supposed to be back at work on the 5th of january because this lockdown's caused delays my boss has had to downsize his company the work's drying up Millions of people across this country are losing their jobs, their businesses, their livelihoods, depression on the rise, suicide on the rise, families being fractured, this government facilitating the demographic replacement of our people. And no one's doing anything about it. Sure, they talk about it, talk about the facts, and they're labelled as racists and bigots and extremists, Nazis. And for what? Our ancestors fought and died for this land. They bled for it and built this nation. Also, 
these people can come into our Houses of Parliament, belittle and undermine our culture, our society, and say that we're mongrels. We don't have a people, we have no culture. Well, what can we do? They want to threaten me financially. No more. No more. I've got no work. My country's lost. And it's time we fought back. So what can I do about it? I'm going to march from the southernmost point of England up to Hadrian's Wall, and I'm going to fly the flag of the White Dragon as a distress signal to all other Englishmen that it is our unity and our freedoms, the very freedoms that this government sought to take from us, that makes us English. I'm going up to Hadrian's Wall, 350 miles, and I'm going to plant that fucking flag. So, I found this fascinating because he's really, he's literalizing this image here. He's literalizing like uh, being in lockdown, being restricted, being uh, forced by the police uh, to, to, you know, behave in a way that he wouldn't behave. He was training with his friends, he says. Uh, and then he kind of like on his morning jog, on his morning, uh, you, know, you know, run through the park, whatever, um, he produces a social media effect of having a meltdown about the political situation of white people in the world being replaced, being devalued and things like that. Um, and kind of like goes from this whole kind of thing that you are supposed to do on social media, go from your own experience, your own everyday into a, you know, big worldview explanation. And then you come up with something um, with a challenge, a social media challenge, you know, like the ice bucket challenge. I'm going to walk up to Hadrian's wall and he actually did. Um, so, so he walked uh, and this is from, from yesterday. Uh, he walked up to Hadrian's Wall, where, which is kind of like where the Roman Empire stopped in the, in the middle of England. Um, and, and he flew the white dragon. And this is kind of like um, what I call fascism as, as media practice. Fascism has become a very, very good and very uh, intimately formulated and very uh, market value or, or market oriented social media practice, which always thrives on these things like I'm formulating an oppression, uh, an experience of oppressedness, and then come up with little self-help things against it, little rebellions, little resistances. And how little these resistances are really varies. Uh, they can be flying, like, like walking to Hadrian's Wall. They can be um, coming to the conclusion that there is no political solution. This is one of the standard right-wing memes or they can come to the conclusion that we need to storm the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., or they can come to the conclusion to, um, to disrupt this oppressive ordinariness, this oppressive everyday, uh, can come to a conclusion like the shooter in Atlanta uh, yesterday uh, who killed six or seven, I don't really know, uh, Asian American women. Um, because of, well, basically misogyny and uh, ideas of, of the great replacement, basically. And these are kind of like the alternative right as media practice produces these little live worlds, which then congeal into larger live worlds for movements like the anti-corona movement, which then stage for themselves little rebellions, little revolutions, little resistances. On social media in the real world, violent, nonviolent whatsoever. And with that, I come back to um, the question from the beginning, and the thing I maybe want to discuss with you people uh, is that I think this digital fascism, as I call it, is a new form of social brokenness. And it produces new forms of the social breaking apart. Uh, the social was broken before, but uh, within this digital condition, um, these fascists and uh, right-wing activists and various uh, people who are adversarial to something uh, come up with new ways of really breaking society apart. And one of them is, I think, visible in this idea of alternate realities, that a person is living in uh, somewhere in England and has the feeling that he has to walk up to a Hadrian's Wall to make a point for white people, that this is a reality that is uh, good, or that some people think 
you know, they are being enslaved by um, mouth and nose protection. Okay, with that, I'll thank you. All right. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Simon, for these interesting but also alarming insights. So yep. everybody, um, we will un you can unmute now your mics and um, please write your question or just your name in the chat so that you can discuss with uh, Simon. And maybe I have uh, one uh, uh, question to start with. Is so. You said that you followed um, the far right movement after the change of government in the U in in the year in January. Um, did you notice changes uh, since then? Um, what is happening after Facebook closed uh, some of the accounts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, kind of like I, I have taken a break ever since uh, Trump lost. And Trump lost in, in January 6th, so, so I'm not really following that much anymore. Um, like Trump was deplatformed, he lost Twitter and, and everything else. A bunch of other uh, things were deplatformed. A big uh, platform for the alternative right in the United States, Parler, was taken down, um, and various other uh, applications and forms were taken down. This already happened in 2019. That was a major blow to my research because in 2019, um, Facebook uh, read it, um, Telegram of sorts, um, and a bunch of other platforms that I was following made huge purges, as the, as the right wing called it, like blocking or drying up people. Like Twitter uh, had a they call it the purge and a large purge in 2019 already. What I saw from that is that nothing much happens. The people go other places, do the same things there. Other places have different, uh, different dynamics of rad radicalization or different uh, genres. So, so you write your right wing propaganda in a different way on Reddit because of the structure of, of the platform than you do on, um, on Twitter, for example. So deplatforming works, but also like uh, it doesn't work completely because the people just go somewhere else. That is one thing. Uh, the other thing, if I understand your question correctly, what happened after Trump? Mm -hmm. In a certain sense, yeah. Um, I think the people are working without Trump very well, probably better, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. because Trump never left. Uh, in a certain sense, he he. Um, he made a great post in, in 2019 where, where he had this, uh, he made a Twitter post and he said all this, uh, the, the first impeachment, uh, this isn't about you, they're not after me, they're after you. And this is what he posted to his followers. And ever since, I think that was the perfect like transition from, you know, figure-centered populism into swarm-driven movement, decentralized movement. Uh, because he basically said to everyone, you are Trump, you know, I'm just, I'm just, uh, you know, they're not after me, they're after you, true Americans or whatever you call them, right? And I think um, this is not about Republicans or Democrats anymore. This is a, a totally free-floating, swarm-driven grassroots movement of people who think there might be a race war necessary, or there might be uh, violent insurrection necessary, or there might be concerted action against a corrupt government of leftists and Democrats and feminists necessary at some point. So I think th this whole, uh, the right wing kernel, what I call the alternative right, is working very well without Trump. They're just continuing on. Mm -hmm. uh, and even better so, because <laughs> They now get to freely do their stuff themselves. Nobody cares about them anymore because everybody thinks Trump is out of office. The nightmare is over. No, it isn't. I think. Okay, that's frightening. And um, you said yeah. that. Um, um, yeah, what I do, you showed us um, examples from the U.S. and from Europe, and. Um, are there any differences between these? Uh, so it's. Uh, a Western movement and um, 
uh, are there differences between the US and, and Europe? And what about Ru Russia, for example? Mm -hmm. I don't know nothing about Russia and new fascism in Russia. So, so there's really not, uh, I haven't read about okay. it. I know from, from when I was in Russia in the 90s, a couple of times, that um, of course they, they have neo fascist movements, they had them forever. Um, and they were very, um, I don't know, uh, uh, visible from what I saw. Um, and kind of like, yeah, yeah, how come they, I don't know too much about Russia, basically. Uh, so, so, so I'd really, really not answer that. Um, how can I the differences between the US and, and Europe? Are there differences, or is it one swarm? It's um, they, they, the, the neo fascists themselves have transatlantic connections. So that Brittany Pettibone and Marty Zerna uh, have married is not an accident. So mm -hmm. there are transatlantic connections, and the people are in dialogue, uh, and the people travel. Lauren Southern went to Paris and to Europe and a couple of times for speaking gigs. And then, the, like the the secret neo fascist organizations, they have networks and they are transnational. The discourse is also transnational. Like they can take, you know, people are, there is immigration in Sweden. This is the same threat in North America. So a North American can, you know, take Sweden as an example for his own feelings. And this is kind of like the transnational connection that they feel. Um, maybe that the differences are marked in that uh, we have a small right wing populist party in Germany. Uh, which kind of like ties into this movement in some way. And America has a large consensual base around extreme conservatism, which becomes more and more extreme. Uh, and this is a radically different like demographic situation, you could say. But I'm still thinking like uh, the, the percentage, uh, percentages of people who, who are open to right-wing populism is the same percentage in a certain sense. Yeah? Okay, so yeah. maybe the audience yeah. has some questions. Mm -hmm. Daniel. Das war nicht wirklich eine Frage, sondern eine Ergänzung zu dem äh, über Trump äh, und dem 2019 Posting. Aber ich hätte noch eine Frage. Ich hoffe, ja, es ist okay, dass ich ihn auf Deutsch frage. Ähm, und zwar, warum glaubst du, dass äh, oder glaubst du, dass die Rechten oder die Alt-Rights oder Neofaschistinnen die digitale Welt besser nutzen können als andere? Liegt es daran, dass sie dieses einfache Antworten auf komplizierte Fragen haben, was ich eigentlich nicht glaube, weil sie sehr kompliziert alles framen? Mhm. Oder liegt es an diesem Konzept von Social-Media-Unternehmen, die halt darauf aufbauen, je mehr Interaktion, desto mehr Profit oder komplett an etwas anderem? Mhm. Äh, super Frage, vielen Dank. Ähm Super weitreichende Frage auch. Ich glaube zum einen, und deswegen habe ich Gamergate mit reingenommen in das Buch, dass viele Sachen von denen, die, jetzt, die ich jetzt beschrieben habe, die aus dem Digitalen kommen, also 4chan zum Beispiel, die dann real werden, die sich mit realen Bewegungen zusammenschließen, ähm, die, die kommen aus dem tiefen Raum, aus der tiefen Geschichte des Internets selber. Und es hat auch historische Bedeutung, wer war zuerst, wer hat zuerst diese Netze dominiert, wer hat sie aufgebaut, wer hat Fortschritte gegründet und so, was für Ideen hatten die Leute, was für eine Peer Group war das. Und sozusagen von da ist organisch äh, eine relativ rechtsgerichtete Gegenöffentlichkeit entstanden. Und das kann man auf YouTube sehr gut nachvollziehen, 2012 ist YouTube komplett antifeministisch. Alle großen YouTube-Produzenten haben sich irgendwie aus irgendwelchen Gründen zum Feminismus verhalten und es sind fast alle Antifeministen. Und das sind Leute, die dann eigentlich relativ schnell oder relativ reibungslos 2015, 16 in die Alt-Right kommen und da irgendwie als dann die Maskulinisten auftreten oder die rationalen Argumentierer oder sowas. Ne? Da gibt es sozusagen Internet-Sachen. Es gibt den zweiten Aspekt, dass tatsächlich wie Plattformen funktionieren, wie Social Media funktionieren und das hat das MIT untersucht, glaube ich, vor, vor zwei Jahren kam diese Studie raus, ähm, Informationen oder Postings, die ähm, sticky sind, die irritieren, die originell sind, haben eine, ich weiß nicht, so und so viel höhere Reichweite als andere. Die werden schneller weitergegeben. Das heißt, alles, was irgendwie transgressiv ist oder auffällig oder so, zirkuliert mehr. 
Und halt solange Social Media komplett auf Engagement oder auf Monetarisierung äh, funktioniert, wird man halt mit äh, einer transgressiven Information oder einem transgressiven Posting immer mehr äh, Reichweite kriegen als sonst was. Und ich habe es bei Reddit äh, auf ein paar Foren so gemacht. Irgendwie die Foren sind quasi aufgebaut, die sehen neutral aus, aber sie privilegieren von der Fragestellung her, von der Themenstellung her, äh, rechte Takes auf Sachen. So, ne? Und es gibt sozusagen, es gibt Strukturen selbst im Internet, in den Plattformen, in den Algorithmen, die einfach diese Position privilegieren. So, ne? Das ist äh, sozusagen infrastruktureller äh, Faschismus. Ja. Ähm, das ist die eine Sache. Warum sie es noch besser können, die Rechte ist irrsinnig lange auf dem Netz und da hat... Äh, da gab es gerade eine Magisterarbeit in, in Siegen zu, die ganz exzellent ist, über die tiefen Geschichte des rechten Internets. Also die äh, Stormfront, amerikanische Neofaschisten hatten 1993, glaube ich, ihr erstes äh, Messageboard und so. Ne? Die sind alle schon wahnsinnig lange da. Und sie bauen auf Gegeninformationen. Und fast die ganzen Social Media haben sich selber aufgestellt als Gegeninformationen. YouTube war your tube. Ja? Das ist die Alternative zum, äh, zum Mainstream. Und das ist ja genau das, was die Alternative, Alternative Rechte beansprucht. Wir sind die Alternative und deswegen ist sozusagen die ganze Social Media schon von vornherein irgendwie als Gegenposition aufgestellt. Manchmal zu guten äh, Effekten, manchmal zu schlechten eben. Und jetzt finde ich extrem viel zu schlechten. Sie sind nicht wirklich besser, sie waren halt teilweise schon früher da, finde ich. Und die Plattformen spielen dem Ganzen sehr in die Hände. Ja. Danke für die Frage. Okay. Eva, äh, könntest du vielleicht deine, deine Präsentation schließen? Dann sehen ah, wir. okay, ja, klar, klar, klar. Oh, jetzt ist mein automatisches Licht hier ausgegangen. Moment, ich mach's mal gerade wieder an. Man kann aber auch äh, das eine Fenster über das andere legen. So. Okay. Ja. Eva? Also, ja, ja. Äh, ja, ich habe ich hab auch ein bisschen eine anschließende Frage an das, was äh, gerade besprochen wurde. Das würde aber mehr äh, die Steuerung von Affekten betreffen. Ja, das ist ja was, worauf du sehr stark abstellst, dass man da irgendwie intuitiv Zugang zu diesen verqueren Ideen finden kann. Jetzt hat ja Propaganda immer schon mit Gefühlen gearbeitet und nicht mit dem rationalen Argument. Jetzt müsste es ja irgendwie einen Unterschied geben zwischen einer analogen Affektsteuerung. Wenn man die, die wunderbaren Beispiele, die du immer zeigst, also wenn ich mir das vorstelle als Plakat oder so im analogen Raum, ja, ja gut, würde genauso gut funktionieren. Ja? Mhm. Aber es funktioniert eben spezifisch besser auf der Grundlage der sogenannten sozialen Medien. Kannst du was sagen? Ich weiß nicht, ob es den Begriff überhaupt gibt, mir ist der gerade irgendwie eingefallen. Es gibt also sowas wie ein, ein kalkuliertes im Wortsinn, ja, ein errechnetes Affektmanagement in den sozialen Medien. Äh, in, inwiefern das eine Rolle spielt? Mhm. Also was, äh, oder, oder anders gefragt, was ist eigentlich der große Unterschied ja, zwischen dem äh, äh, Social Media Affektmanagement und der, der üblichen Art äh, von Propaganda. Mhm. Ähm, es ist personalisiert. Ne? Also bei Propaganda hast du sozusagen ein Propaganda-Organ eigentlich, was äh, die Propaganda rausgibt und hast du ein Wahlplakat oder wie auch immer was. Und es kommt dann zu dir in verschiedenen Situationen, die halt äh, mehr oder weniger öffentlich sind oder so. Während bei Social Media sozusagen... Deswegen zeige ich immer diesen Mann, der, der, der mit den Medien spricht auf der AfD-Demo zu sagen, man selbst bringt sich schon in die Produktionsebene. Also man ist eben nicht Konsument von Pro Propaganda, sondern es ist äh, teilnehmende Propaganda. Es ist prosumentisch. Äh, ein chinesischer Wissenschaftler hat es Participatory Propaganda genannt. Also man, man baut sich seine, seine Verblendung, seine Ideologie, seine Propaganda eigentlich selbst, weil das auch viel mehr Spaß macht. Und es ist so ein Witz an diesen Verschwörungstheorien wie QAnon zum Beispiel, das sind äh, große kollektive Unternehmungen, die kommen von nirgendwo, die werden auch von nirgendwo gesteuert. Äh, es gibt kein Organ, was diese Propaganda veräußert, sondern die Leute bauen das selbst äh, als Schwarmbewegung. Und das ist sozusagen Community-Event und so. Und das ist, ähm, 
das ist etwas, was die sozialen Medien total anreizen. Es ist super, ähm, wenn man auf Facebook Teil von dieser Bubble ist und sich um eine Bubble kümmert. Ich habe ja auch eine Bubble. Ne? Aber dann kümmere ich mich um die und dann denke ich, was könnte denen heute gefallen und so. Man denkt schon selber äh, aufmerksamkeitsökonomisch, man denkt äh, als Marke sozusagen. Ne? Und das ist eine Sache, die, die äh, bei den Rechten halt total gut funktioniert und die zu sowas wie Verschwörungstheorien zu, zu, einen ganz leichten Zugang gibt, weil man baut die ganze Zeit an alternativen Weltsichten. Und wenn das möglichst viele Leute machen, so, dann ist man affektiv, äh, ich, ich beschreibe immer, der, 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 man muss sich den Faschisten gerade als glücklichen Menschen vorstellen, weil der äh, tatsächlich irgendwie, wenn du Verschwörungstheoretiker bist, du hast nur Freunde, irgendwie überall, die da dran mitarbeiten und sowas. Ne? Und dann kommt man nur mal zufällig vor die Tür und kriegt dann diese andere Propaganda, gegen die man halt ist, so vor, die, äh, vor den Latz geknallt und ist auf einmal ein Covidiot oder wie auch immer. Ähm, ich glaube, das sind ganz spezifische äh, Sachen, die mit dieser Aktivierung, die im Netz, die man machen muss, um ins Netz zu kommen. Man konsumiert nicht, sondern man muss was posten. Man, man muss seine Sachen kuratieren, die man sieht und so weiter. Ne? Und, dem, ähm, und das ist eine sehr spezifische Affektarbeit, die man da macht, die ich auch finde, ähm, das ist mit diesen alten Emotionspropaganda-Sachen nicht so gut beschrieben. Also da kommt die Propaganda und fach die Wut an oder manipuliert die Masse oder sowas. Die Massen machen das selbst, weil man muss sich ja irgendwie auf Social Media orientieren. Man muss sehen, was ist denn heute auf Twitter los? Und wie ist, denn, ist dieses Video hier beliebt, was ich gerade geguckt habe oder so? Ne? Es ist ja, das ganze Internet ist eine, ist eine Art Gefühlsraum, wo man sich so tastend äh, irgendwie fortbewegt. Ne? Wie geht es mir heute? Wie viel sage ich von mir? Wie viel zeige ich von mir? Und so weiter. Ne? Ähm, und das, finde ich, sind sehr spezifische Effekte die, die, oder, oder Szenarien, die diese Sachen, die ich vorgestellt habe, also kleine Szenarien der Unterdrückung meiner eigenen und wie ich das dann besiegt habe und so, die das total fördern. Und das, finde ich, ist ein großer Unterschied zu dem, was vorher war. Also halt die Nationalsozialisten konnten nicht kommunizieren, äh, warum du gerade keinen Sex kriegst zum Beispiel. Und das dann zurückbinden da dran. So, ne? Natürlich hatten die ihre Körperideale und Arno Breker und was weiß ich was. Und so, ne? Aber halt dieses Ding, dass dann äh, ein 15-Jähriger auf, auf YouTube sagt, er hat Probleme, eine Freundin zu finden und dann kommt Martin Sellner oder er kommt selber drauf. Das muss ja das Great Replacement sein. Äh, das ist schon irre. Und das gab es vorher nicht. So, ne? Da gibt es übrigens das tolle Buch äh, von... von Veronika Kracher zu den Insel Communities, da geht es genau darum, und, äh, wie das sozusagen, das ist äh, eine ganz intime und auch normale Welt, wo man so versucht, irgendwie sich irgendwie einen Weltzusammenhang zu bauen, warum geht es mir denn heute so schlecht? Und es ist halt bei diesen Angeboten, die dann da sind, gerade auf Social Media, ist es halt sehr schnell für jemanden äh, bei der Hand, dass es irgendwie einen größeren Zusammenhang zwischen Feminismus und Sozialdemokratie und Migration gibt, der dafür sorgt, dass du, du gerade, dass es dir total schlecht geht und so. Und dann gehst du eben joggen und beschließt, ich äh, laufe zu Hadrian's Wall. Das ist schon, also, kann man ja froh sein, dass er nur das gemacht hat. Ja, beantwortet das deine Frage, Eva? Ja, ja, mir ist die Antwort auch völlig einläufig. Ja. Äh, zwischendurch, also äh, hatte ich noch so, das war ein bisschen eine andere Frage, das betrifft jetzt aber wirklich den Begriff der Propaganda selber, äh, weil du den gar nicht benutzt. Ja, du hast ja von Metapolitik gesprochen, aber nicht von Propaganda, aber du hast sehr wohl von Agitation äh, gesprochen. Also äh, magst du den Propagandabegriff nicht, weil er auf die neuen technischen Bedingungen äh, nicht mehr zugrifft? Doch, es gibt auch klare Pro Propaganda, das, das ist klar. So, ne? Was die AfD macht, ist sehr klare Propaganda und so. Ne? Es passt halt, als Begriff passt es weniger zu diesen Memes äh, und diesen kleinen Social Media Stories, die, die ich halt untersuche. Also dieses Alltägliche. Propaganda tut halt immer so, als ob es etwas, da kommt etwas äh, Übermächtiges in den Alltag rein. Ja? Und das ist die Idee, die man hat von Massenmanipulation. Da sind die, die Leute und dann durch Propaganda werden die zu einer Masse und das kommt so von außen. Und das trifft halt das, was diese Leute da selber bauen, nicht so richtig dazu. Es ist schon Agitation, weil die Leute wollen zeigen, dass sie agitiert sind von was. So, ne? Aber es ist nicht, es kommt halt nicht von außen. Und das ist der Witz an Social Media. Es kommt immer von einem befreundeten, intimen irgendwie gegenüber. So, ne? Um, darf ich da vielleicht noch kurz anschließen, weil mir geistert jetzt auch so ein bisschen der Begriff des Influencers, der Influencerin im Kopf herum, 
weil du jetzt gesagt hast, es sind eher so Privatpersonen, die halt unter Freunde, Freundinnen was teilen, aber gibt es auch solche, die große, also wirklich viele Follower haben, die man vielleicht wirklich schon als alt right influencer beschreiben könnte, die wirklich breit rezipiert werden? Ja klar, ich meine, das sind, äh, ich wollte gar nicht sagen, das sind Freunde und Freundinnen, aber halt, wenn Martin Sellner halt zu äh, 1,3 Millionen Leuten spricht auf Twitter, wie er das konnte bis letztes Jahr, ähm, dann spricht er halt nicht als großer Kanal, als, als Partei oder so. Ne? Es ist halt immer noch, der, der, hat, der hat auch seinen Privatkanal, den hat er jetzt noch auf Telegram, ne? also Martin Privat. Und da postet er halt aus seinem Ostergröße und all so ein Kram, was man halt so als weißer Mann dann alles macht. Und so, ne? ähm, das ist halt der Witz an Social Media, du siehst dann bei Leuten wie PewDiePie oder so, da siehst du nicht, dass die äh, eine Milliarde Follower haben. Der ist immer noch derselbe Depp zu Hause, so, ne? irgendwie der da irgendwie was erzählt. Und die Zahlen, äh, die Leute, die ich untersucht habe, die haben halt teilweise bis zu, äh, bis zu drei Millionen Follower auf YouTube zum Beispiel und so. Ne? Das, das Modell ist aber immer dasselbe, nämlich, dass die irgendwie zu Hause rumsitzen und Videos machen. Dass sie rumsitzen und äh, twittern und dann auf dasselbe reagieren auf Twitter, auf was ich auch gerade reagiere. Ne? Weil X geht durch die Zeitung, äh, irgendwas und die kommentieren halt den rechten Kram dazu und kuratieren die rechte Timeline. Ich... Äh, kommentiere dann was anderes dazu oder so. Ne? Also es sind teilweise, und, und es sind viele große, sind halt von Twitter verschwunden oder von den anderen Plattformen, aber andere sind auch genauso noch da. Es gibt Paul Joseph Watson, einen der wichtigsten äh, britischen Outwriter, äh, der ist immer noch auf Twitter unterwegs mit 1,3 Millionen Followern, der haut es jeden Tag noch raus. Ne? Es ist, ähm, es macht nicht so viel. Man spricht halt immer als Privatperson irgendwie, also irgendwie als Institution und Privatperson gleichzeitig auf Social Media, ist so meine Erfahrung. Man ist immer beides, man ist eine kleine, intime Öffentlichkeit. So, ne? Und ähm, das macht diese verqueren Formen so möglich, dieses Influencing, dass man gleichzeitig, äh, man ist man selber, aber gleichzeitig ist man auch eine Institution und so. Und das, äh, und das macht beim Faschismus, so wie er gerade aufgestellt ist, wahnsinnig viel Sinn, das so zu tun. Weil die halt eben von der persönlichen Bedrohung ausgehen. Ja. Jetzt hat Martha äh, im mhm. Chat eine relativ ausführliche Frage gestellt. Martha, möchtest du sie bitte selber vorlesen? Sonst kann ich das aber auch für dich tun. Ich kann es auch vorlesen, ja. Also es geht um die Gamification in rechter und extremer Propaganda. Ähm, wozu Kalendal auf Instagram, okay. äh, ich folge dem, ähm, so ein paar Sachen, so ein paar Gedanken geäußert hat und es ging um das Beispiel des Sturms auf das Kapitol in Washington mhm. und er hat darüber gesprochen, ich lese es einfach jetzt mal kurz, kurz vor, äh, es gibt Ansätze über eine Gamification-Theorie, dass es Punkte und Highscores für Fotos von unter anderem dem Stehlen bestimmter Objekte im Kapitol gegeben haben soll. Das mhm. Herausstechen von Kostümen soll als Wiedererkennungswert gedient haben, um Repostings dieser Fotos zu provozieren. Das Reposting würde sowohl weitere Punkte generieren, als auch die Täterinnen bestätigen. Ähm, und die Frage an dich wäre, waren solche Highscores und diese Gaming-Strukturen in den Foren nachvollziehbar oder sichtbar? Und äh, wie kann man medienethisch auf diese Parallelrealität des Spiels und dem damit verbundenen Livestreaming mit rassistischen und terroristischen Aktionen umgehen oder reagieren? Mhm. Super, äh, ganz, ganz großer Artikel Zusammenhang, auch äh, sehr, sehr weitreichend. Ich habe gerade einen Aufsatz abgegeben zu äh, bei der Zeitschrift für Medienwissenschaften, Schwerpunkt Spiel zu Gamification von Faschismus. Ähm, und da setze ich mich unter anderem mit dem, mit dem Halle-Attentäter auseinander, der so, so eine, ähm, äh, 2019, der, der so eine Art Manifest dazu hatte, wo er Gaming Achievements auflistet, also halt wie viele wie viele jüdische Menschen erschossen und so weiter. Das sind Achievements, das ist Gamersprache. So, ja. Ich schreibe dann da ein bisschen viele Sachen zu. Zu dem, was du hier beschreibst, also halt, dass Menschen sozusagen an diesem Sturm teilnehmen, um daraus einen Wiedererkennungswert oder auch eine, so eine Attention Value, also halt, man, man, man bekommt quasi Aufmerksamkeit dafür ausgezahlt, je nachdem, was man für eine provokative Aktion macht, welches Kostüm oder so, und dann hat dieser äh, Quanon büffelhorn typ da natürlich gewonnen. So, ne? ähm, Gamifizierung ist das Grundprinzip der, der sozialen Medien. 
also nach Likes zu gucken, wie viele Likes man kriegt. Äh, auf Reddit gibt es Upvotes und Downvotes und so weiter. Kommentarfunktion. Das ist Gamifizierung. Also halt, man wird belohnt, äh, wenn man bestimmte Sachen tut. Wenn man sich an bestimmte Genres hält, wenn man bestimmte Mechaniken einhält und sowas. Und das Ganze ist sowieso ein Spiel um Aufmerksamkeit. Und das machen die Rechten natürlich genauso. Und auch mit diesen Dingern. Und äh, ein Punkt, der mir immer sehr wichtig ist, an all diesen Leuten, die auf Social Media dann sind, hängt letzten Endes nicht nur ein Lebensmodell, sondern meistens auch ein Karrieremodell. Also halt Martin Sellner verdient relativ viel Geld damit, äh, was er für eine Exposure hat. Und das ist dann auch ein Sinn am Deplatforming, wenn man, äh, wenn man ihm Twitter wegnimmt oder Patreon wegnimmt oder so, dann fällt ihm eine Menge Geld weg. Ähm, und es sind äh, teilweise große Existenzen, die dann auch großartig scheitern, äh, äh, wenn das Modell ausgelaufen ist oder nicht mehr so gut funktioniert. Äh, das heißt, diese Gamifizierung ist auch... Äh, Funktioniert auch durch die Monetarisierung. Also wie viel Transgression kannst du organisieren, wie viel Exposure kriegst du dafür, wie viel Attention. Und dann bedeutet das auch nachher echtes Geld. sozusagen. Die ganzen Social Media sind gamifiziert und insofern ist auch der Faschismus gamifiziert. Aber eben mit so, mit so Sachen wie entweder der Gamersprache oder dass die Leute aus dem Gamer-Umfeld kommen und dann zum Beispiel Sachen nutzen wie Twitch, um ihre Anschläge zu, zu, ähm, zu übertragen, dass daraus dann wieder Fankulturen entstehen, die äh, das gamifizieren für sich selber. Also wer kann das am besten nachstellen oder was weiß ich, wer, wer kann es in das beste Meme verbauen oder so. Das sind alles Spielstrukturen, die, ähm, die eine Eigendynamik haben. Ich glaube, das ist das Wichtige daran zu verstehen, dass, es, dass die Gamifizierung eine Eigendynamik darstellt, die aus dem Medium herauskommt. Das ist so ein bisschen der Punkt. Ich finde zum Beispiel QAnon ist, ist eine Spielbewegung. Das sind Leute, die spielen mit der Realität. Und zwar gemeinsam. Und das ist eine unheimlich äh, fröhliche, ich folge den QAnon-Channels auf, auf Telegram, das ist eine unheimlich fröhliche äh, äh, Sache, ständig rauszufinden, dass irgendwie eine jüdische Weltverschwörung dahinter steckt, am kleinsten Detail äh, im Supermarkt oder so. Das sind Spielbewegungen, kollektive Spiele eigentlich. Ja, das also, das ist die Frage... War das? Äh, ein Stück weit auf jeden Fall. Ähm, äh, du hast dich ja jetzt auf diesen, auf diesen unzähligen Foren rumgetrieben. Gab es tatsächlich äh, solche Highscores oder irgendwie, das, dass man das nachvollziehen konnte? Ich meine, klar, der Büffel war auf jeden Fall die stärkste Medienfigur. Mhm. Ähm, aber gab es in irgendeiner Form einen, einen Highscore oder wirklich so Spielstrukturen, die als solche auch sichtbar waren? Oder? Also auf dem Forum, wo ich war, das war halt The Donald, solange das noch funktionierte, der, der Nachfolger davon, ähm, da war das nicht. Ich meine, die feiern sich sowieso die ganze Zeit ab. So, ne, irgendwie. Und äh, da wird dann auch immer de, das beste Meme prämiert und so. Das heißt, diese, ähm, diese Spielstrukturen oder diese Belohnungsstrukturen, die funktionieren die ganze Zeit. Ähm, ich habe aber jetzt nichts gesehen, das, was du sagst, also dass sozusagen die äh, Punkte vergeben wurden unter den Leuten, die auf den Fotos zu sehen waren, habe ich nicht gesehen. Aber das dann erschließt sich für mich auch, weil ich wundere mich immer, dass sich so viele unterschiedliche Gruppierungen irgendwie zu, äh, zu einer großen Bewegung verbinden und dass es da offenbar überhaupt keine ideologischen Probleme gibt. Also, da, aber das liegt offenbar nicht daran, dass, dass sie sich differenzieren müssen, ideologisch differenzieren müssen, sondern dass es um ganz was anderes geht, dass es um Aufmerksamkeiten geht, dass es um Spiel und darüber verbinden sich dann alle und die Ideologie die dann transportiert wird, ist eigentlich eher zweitrangig, so verstehe ich das. Okay. Ja, ähm, das hat ähm, Kars Mode, der, der berühmte äh, Rechtsextremismusforscher, der seit 20 Jahren, 25 Jahren darüber arbeitet, hat das nach der Unite the Right geschrieben. Ähm, er sagte, irgendwie drei Jahre nach der Unite the Right Demonstration sehen wir, die, die Rechte ist überhaupt nicht vereinigt, sie ist total zersplittert und zerstritten. Das ist in einer dezentralen Informationsökonomie wie dem Internet ist das ein wahnsinniger Vorteil. Äh, wenn du nicht vereinigt bist, also eine Plattform hast, sondern wenn du zersplittert bist auf alle möglichen Plattformen und dich auch noch die ganze Zeit super interessant darüber streiten kannst, auf YouTube zum Beispiel, soll es jetzt, muss nationalistisch weiß sein oder reicht auch nur Nationalismus? Civic Nationalism nennen die das dann. Ne? Und dann redet halt der eine Nationalist, diskutiert mit dem, mit dem, äh, mit dem White Nationalist und das Ganze dann vor YouTube-Publikum, die das irgendwie eine interessante Frage findet. So, ne? Und ähm, 
Und, und das sind so Differenziertheit, also Differenzierung oder auch Zerstreuung ist ein irrsinniger Vorteil, weil du mehr Anschlussstellen produzieren kannst zu mehr Leuten. Und das macht die Rechte absolut genial. Ähm, und, und bindet damit wahnsinnig viele verschiedene Leute ein. Also die einen sind mehr Verschwörungstheorie, die anderen sind halt irgendwie eher hartrechts, die anderen sind identitär, die anderen sind einfach nur Antifeministen. Sie treffen aber alle irgendwo sich gemeinsam bei derselben Stimmung, nämlich der unterdrückt zu sein. Ähm, durch einen phantasmatischen Gegner wie die Gender Studies zum Beispiel. Mhm. Ähm, und das ist ein unheimlicher Vorteil, dass die, dass die keine gemeinsame Bewegung sind. Deswegen sind die populistischen Parteien so ein bisschen extra die, die kommen da auch teilweise gar nicht so vor. Ne? Wählen muss man eher nur alle vier Jahre. Manchmal bringen die einen guten Aufmerksamkeitspunkt, so einen guten Aufreger oder so, aber manchmal ist es auch egal, weil du findest sowieso, äh, du gehst in den Supermarkt und äh, siehst, dass äh, was weiß ich, was passiert ist und daran siehst du schon wieder, dass du unterdrückt wirst und so. Ne? Kann, musst eine Maske anziehen oder die äh, Frau an der Kasse vor dir ist nicht weiß oder so. Ne? Das wirkt viel besser und da können die viel mehr mitspielen mit diesen Informationen als mit dem, was die AfD sagt. Interessiert auch, aber eigentlich, äh, es ist nur eine Bewegung unter vielen, was die AfD macht. Mhm. Ja. Zerstreuung ist im digitalen Zeitalter ein wahnsinniger Vorteil. Ja, ja. Okay, gibt es noch Fragen? Wir sind das Ganze ins Deutsche geswitcht, aber so wie ich sehe, können alle Deutsch, die hier äh, jetzt. Äh, <lacht> ja, noch da sind. Ich glaube, nachdem wir jetzt schon kurz vor acht haben, haben wir uns unser Bier oder alkoholfreies <lacht> Bier oder whatever verdient. Und ich möchte ja. dir ganz, ganz herzlich danken für die wirklich interessanten und aber gleichzeitig auch total schrecklichen äh, Vorstellungen des Themas und Einblicke in das Thema. Und bin sehr froh, dass du das, äh, dass du gekommen bist oder äh, ja. online gekommen bist. Wir hatten irgendwie ja 60 Anmeldungen, so viele kamen jetzt natürlich doch nicht. Das ist aber immer so, das ist ganz normal an der Kunstuni. Wir sind froh, dass überhaupt so viele gekommen sind. Vielen Dank, dass ihr alle da wart und zugehört habt. Und äh, genau, wir sehen uns äh, sowieso die nächsten Tage wieder. Und ähm, vielleicht bleibst du noch ganz kurz in der Runde, Simon, dass, ähm, okay. dass wir noch kurz die Bezahlung dann besprechen, wenn alle anderen dann ausgestiegen sind. Ja. Okay, okay. Dann danke und tschüss und schönen ja. Abend euch allen. Ja, ja. lass mich auch noch mal Danke sagen allen fürs Zuhören und für die tollen Fragen. Und ja, ich finde einfach, es ist wahnsinnig depressiv, äh, deprimierend, aber es gibt auch wahnsinnig viel zu tun, also gerade für Leute wie, äh, wie uns in der, in der Medienwissenschaft oder auch in der, in der Kulturproduktion, einfach weil so viel Antworten darauf eben nicht direkt parteipolitisch oder vom Staat ausgehen können, sondern auch eher von unten kommen müssen mhm. äh, und aus verschiedenen Sachen. Deswegen mhm. vielen, vielen Dank für die Einladung und fürs Diskutieren. Super. Super. Super.